All right, everybody, welcome to this week's Beginner Farmer Growing Collaborative video series on how to collect and market honeybee products. Um, so joining me today are Carl and Al, who both have a lot of experience in beekeeping. Um, I myself have also been a, a beekeeper for most of my life. I've been lucky enough to be around it. Um, Carl, do you want to start by sharing a little bit about how you got into beekeeping, what kind of experience you have, stuff like that? Sure. Well, actually, I uh, started when I was 15 years old, and I went to uh, Penn State, and I saw an observation beehive that I really was fascinated by it and was interested in, and thought, wow, I'd really like to have one of those. So when I got home, I was, I guess it went on about a year or so, but I was about 16, I think, when I bought my first two beehives, and I was beekeeper for probably 10, 15 years. Kind of went away from it for a while, you know, marrying kids and all that, and moving a lot. So about 10 years ago, my wife, my wonderful wife, she bought me a gift certificate for Dedant Beekeeping Supply Company, and I got back into beekeeping. So this latest round, I've been about 10 years beekeeping, so a total maybe about 20 years I've been keeping hives and, and raising honeybees. It's been a lot of fun. I enjoy it. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing, Carl. Um, Al, would you want to share a little bit about kind of sure, my, your experience and whatnot? Sure. Mine was kind of similar. I was a teenager, and we had a swarm of bees in our yard, and a gentleman came out to capture them. They were way up in a tree, and he tied a rope on it, cut the branch down, lowered them down. Well, they'd been there long enough, there was comb in it. So by the time that those bees had been hived, he messed with the comb and gotten the thing in there and I was hooked and so I had the, the really wonderful opportunity to bum around with two of the greatest beekeepers in Ohio which I didn't know at the time they were just neighbors but that was W. Stephen and Walter Rothenbuehler so I had some great mentors um, and I also took a few years off while I was in college I developed a bee sting allergy so I had to be very careful and carry an EpiPen around for a number of years, but I still kept doing it. And then after I got married and uh, had some couple of kids, my girls came with me so that I didn't have to worry. If I got stung, I could leave and they could close the hive up. But now I get stung and I don't even swell up or itch. And I don't worry about an EpiPen anymore. I can get multiple bee stings and they don't bother me a bit. But uh, the last, 10 years I've sort of been semi-retired and I've really learned more and gotten more involved in the hobby. I have about 25 eyes of bees now produced last year. We produced 660 pounds of honey and um, this year for the first time ever I've sold some bees. I've been selling bees and nukes and that's a whole different world. A lot, a lot of fun too. So. For me, it's been a lifelong hobby. It's still a hobby, but um, last year, two years, I've made more than, than I spent. So that means it's a sideline business. <laughs> all. Absolutely, and, absolutely. So, and I have, I have bees in several yards. I've got bees in an apple orchard and a, cup, uh, a uh, black locust grove and a couple of clover lawn uh, farm areas. So I've diversified that way. So I, I spread those 25 bees around through six yards. Right. So that's a pain to take care of, but it's it's a lot of fun. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so as you can tell, you know we have a lot of uh, varying experience here. Um, I thought I'd share a little bit about myself and how I got into it as well. Um, I had moved to a farm when I was in about the third grade, and we had all sorts of things going on. And for most of you know my early childhood, we had one or two hives that my dad had taken care of, kind of in honor of his grandmother who had um, bees. And we even have a smoker that has like her, her name on it that we would use. Um, and so as I you know continued to get older, it was actually because of some fostering by my eighth grade science teacher and my ag teacher once I got into high school that were really um, insistent on me continuing to pursue this, um, you know, to pursue beekeeping. And in, particular research in beekeeping. So I had done, you know, multiple research projects around beekeeping, um, you know, in middle school and then again in high school and have been able to, you know, grow my business also in beekeeping. I had about 13 hives, I think, at the most. Um, 
and would, you know, collect the honey, sell honey to local shops, things like that, um, along with, you know, doing the research um, as well. So, you know, I've had a lot of experience doing it. I don't take care of any hives right now other than the ones at Stratford Ecological Center. Um, my parents had recently moved and we sold our hives, so I sold about five hives to someone uh, back home where I am from. And so um, that's kind of my experience with it, I guess. Um, I had a lot of focus on looking at like pollen samples um, in honey samples, so that was really neat to learn about. And so I'm excited to kind of pick the brains of these two guys here today uh, to learn a little bit more about some other beekeeping products. We oftentimes think about honeybee products as being honey and maybe only thinking of honey. Uh, but if you look back in history, you know, using honeybee products has ranged widely. We look at ancient Egyptians using propolis, looking at pollen, using honey. Um, there's so many different uses for, um, you know, with honeybees. You know, we were even talking about using honeybee like stings and venom uh, to cure, you know, arthritis and different things like that. So I'm excited to kind of go through this, um, you know, video today and have a conversation um, and really look about uh, what we're going to be talking about and kind of, you know, grow as beekeepers ourselves as we are beginner farmers and, you know, beginner beekeepers. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and show you the schedule for the Beginner Farmer Growing Collaborative series so that if you see a topic that you're interested in watching, you know, you can make sure to get that date down um, and so on. I want to also remind everyone to check out the links in our description. I have linked Stratford Ecological Center I want you, you know, if you haven't yet, go check out our website, see some other resources that we provide. Um, also check out the link to donate. If you're able to or willing, we have a link to donate that continues to support what we're doing here so, to support Stratford Ecological Center. Um, so yeah, I'm going to go ahead and show you that schedule and then we will continue on with the video. All right, so we are now back at it. Um, I want to start by first talking about honey. So like I said before, a lot of us first think about honey when we think about collecting pollinator or collecting honeybee products. And so um, we're all going to talk about kind of like our experience with extracting honey, kind of break down the process. And I can show you all a few pictures of what, you know, we do and how to do it. Um, so I'll go ahead and show that first picture. Um, so this is an image of a volunteer checking out our um, honey hives. Do you, does anyone want to kind of talk about what's going on here? Sure. She's um, pulling a frame of honey out of a hive that is capped over. So it's got some, some uh, honey in there that the bees will bring in nectar and fill the frame with it, fill the individual cells in that frame with nectar. And then that um, nectar they fan and dry it down until it reaches a certain specific gravity. Um, optimally it should be somewhere around less than 18 percent, 17 is ideal to keep that honey so that it doesn't ferment. And if so if you have a frame of honey that's completely capped over then you could steal it and extract it and it shouldn't um, uh, ferment in the jar and so that's that's one goal is to make sure that whole frame is capped before you extract it and so that's that's the first step pull the frame <laughs> out of the hive and get the bees off of it absolutely um, going on to the the next step here you can kind of see you know brushing off the bees you see some smoke kind of up in the corner um, one of our beekeepers at Stratford Kristen she always says like never go into a hive without smoke that's like her number one rule um, so I want to point that out to any like beginner beekeepers or anybody that's interested in beekeeping. I'm sure she'd be happy to hear, you know, you know, I'm reinforcing the smoke. <laughs> um, but kind of like what Al said, we're looking for that capped honey, but then we also want to make sure that we, you know, brush off any bees that are on that frame. That way we aren't taking bees back, you know, inside our house, inside, you know, wherever we're extracting. 
looking at the the next picture, do you kind of want to explain what's going on here, Carl? Sure. Yeah. So now that you got the frame back into the place wherever you're going to be extracting, and in this particular case, it looks like the greenhouse at Stratford, you kind of want to do it inside because if you do it outside, well, you're going to get a lot of bees coming that are going to be trying to rob that honey and take it back to their hive. And that's not particularly good for your beehives to have uh, the bees robbing honey <laughs> from other places. But so inside, you go inside and what she's doing is either using an electric knife or a, a regular knife and you have to cut off all of the caps on those little cells uh, so that the honey will come out. And that's what she's doing there. She's decapping that frame. She'll do it on both sides and then it should be ready to be extracted. Yeah, absolutely. So since we're kind of looking at like uncapping the honey, does anyone want to talk about what we can do with the cappings of the honey or of the honey frame? Sure. When, when, once the cappings come off, they, you, they fall into a tub of some, some kind. Uh, I have a big pan and I've got a, a board across that with a nail in the middle, which helps to support the frame so it doesn't slide around and then those cappings fall into that pan. So once we're done with a particular harvest, we'll take those cappings and drain them for a while and utilize all the honey that drains out of them. Then we put those cappings into a solar wax melter and that melts down everything that's in there. So it's gonna melt the honey that's in there, the wax that's there and any uh, propolis or bee parts or anything else. And so th that then slides down this tray, goes through a screen into a pan, and the, you get a beautiful little cake of wax floating on a bed of honey. And that, then we should talk about what to do with the wax. Yeah. And uh, we, we do a number of things. We make candles. Mm -hmm. um, we sell some of the wax to others who use it to make hand cream with. Mm -hmm. And we also utilize some to go back to re-wax any kind of plastic foundation that goes back into the hive and things like that. I made my living as a carpenter and the, the guy that I when mentored me many, many years ago as a trim carpenter, back then we didn't have nail guns and every good carpenter carried a cake of beeswax to wax your nails with. And the same with screws, you know, you put a little bit on screw or nail and it goes in much cleaner and doesn't split. So there's lots of uses for these wax. Absolutely. And my um, wife, she's an artist, so what she does with the wax that we get out of our hives is we'll melt it down and you can mix pigments in with the wax mm -hmm. and you can actually paint with that. So she does really? paintings, it's called encaustic mm -hmm. paintings. And it's a, it's a process that the ancient Egyptians used to use with their wax. And that's how they used to paint all those beautiful pictures inside their tombs and on their on their uh, you know their uh, burial chambers and all that. That's a lot of that is paint that was created by using the beeswax they got from their their bees. Which reminds me of another one too. Is that as a wood turner, um, my bowls and many of my friends use a one part beeswax to two part mineral oil that heat up until it becomes a gel, and that's what we use for finish on oh. the salad bowls. It's a beautiful finish, it's edible, hardens up nicely, and it's easy to make, and uh, you don't have to worry about it being food grade. Mm -hmm. So that's that's another... Lots of uses. For lots us. of uses. Yeah. Lots of uses. Absolutely. I know um, when we would collect uh, the honey, I would not process the wax. I, I felt that it was just too um, kind of you know, complicated and dirty. And, kind of messy, so my brother would take care of all of it. So I'm really glad that he would do that. He would do all of the filtering, all of that kind of thing. Um, and then my mom, she really enjoyed making soap, so she would make these wax soap. Um, so definitely if you're trying to develop yourself as a beekeeper and really market yourself, I think you know utilizing a lot of these different um, uses and resources from things that you can collect um, and have different things that you can sell. Because you know sometimes the people want to buy honey, sometimes people don't want to buy honey. So definitely being able to have these additional products will be useful um, for yourself as you kind of establish yourself more as a beekeeper in your area. Um, so coming back to honey a little bit more, how do you both, you know, price your honey? 
So I know that, you know, here at Stratford, we price our honey, um, you know, like $20 for two pounds. I think it was $14 for a pound about, um, I know, and lots of other beekeepers price their honey differently. Kind of what is your you know, take on it? How do you price it? Hmm. It is. <laughs> so, so there's a couple of different ways you can go about that. One is going to farmer's markets and seeing what other people are pricing their honey at and kind mm -hmm. of getting a feel for, for what it's going for. There's also a magazine, Bee Culture magazine, that's by AI Root Company mm -hmm. that is uh, published here in the state of Ohio. Mm -hmm. And in there, they always have a page on what honey is going for, what the pollen, what the wax is going for. So that'd be like another way just to check yourself to make sure you're not too, too seems, high or too low. Or it seems to be commodity pricing though. It always seems extremely low to me. Yeah, the ones in the root. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I, I agree, but the the I think it's a true supply and demand. For sure, honey used to be really cheap, and you could just you might as well give it away. And uh, now it's gotten to the point where it's that's the Stratford is a good ballpark. I mm -hmm. I sell mine in pint jars, which is a pound and it's about twenty two ounces, so mm -hmm. it's a little more than a pound and a quarter per jar, and we sell that for twelve dollars. And we sell. Um, um, we sell quartz, we also sell some quinline. You have to kind of price the jars too. That you, you guys are using really expensive jars, mm -hmm. those muff jars. And um, it, it makes a difference how much your labels cost, what your market is. Are you wholesaling it to another place and then they're marking it up? Right. Um, so I've got mine in a couple of uh, markets and we have to wholesale to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, that never tastes quite as good as it does when I sell it out of the front of the house. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I know um, we would sell about a pound for $8. We would do half a pound for $6. Um, and we would sell to like a few different uh, little shops around town where I'm from. How long ago? Um, probably three or four years ago. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, you know, those were, you know, we would get only a portion of what we were actually selling. I've seen it all over the place. Right. You know, when Stratford has their, their fair in the spring and there were lots of other honey producers coming in, mm -hmm. there was one one outfit coming in and their honey was half what everybody else was. Right. They sold out and went home, but yeah. um, I, I was surprised. Yeah, no, definitely. I know like the area where I was, um, you know, beekeeping and kind of selling to, there were probably three or four other like much bigger beekeepers in the area that could sell their product at a, a little bit of a cheaper price, even though I feel like mine was pretty already low, um, low price. So that's just something to like keep in mind. I know we are always talking about kind of like, what are your goals? Um, within our beginner farmer series, we've been talking about kind of like, you know, pricing, marketing, things like that, that are all important things to consider when thinking about, you know, going into this profession, perhaps. Um, I so, think if you could break even. <laughs> You know, you're, you're doing pretty good because of all the other benefits you get on a farm from those bees. Right. Right? I yeah. mean, you're getting a lot of other good stuff from the bees, and not just the honey, so. Yeah. And there, there's lots of, I have a friend who's got 150 hives. He pretty much doesn't mess with selling his honey, puts in 55-gallon drums and all sets of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, he makes his money off pollination. Right. And... Uh, um, he makes some off the honey too. Yeah. So I enjoy, I probably give away a third of what I make. Yeah. So that's, that's fun. It's a great gift. Yeah, for yeah, sure. You can feel good about it. Yeah, absolutely. If you're someone that's uh, maybe just interested in, you know, getting into beekeeping as a hobby, I think having like one or two hives is um, a great option and it's always a, you know, an awesome gift to give around the holidays uh, for anybody, you know. So. Uh, those are some things to keep in mind. My advice is always to have two hives because then you can use one of them to rescue the other one. That's true, yeah. yeah. So a lot of my customers, I actually have quite a few that have kids that have allergies. Mm -hmm. So I usually give them a break and don't charge them as much because they swear that by using my honey and giving them a little bit of that honey every day, mm -hmm. it really minimizes the, the allergies. So Yeah. And that, that's a good thing. I believe that's the, the one of the few things that they can't prove. Yeah, I don't know. Um, and many of if the you talk to these parents, are, yeah, they're yeah. they're saying absolutely. Yeah, so I don't know. I don't know. Could be. Yeah. Could be. That, 
People buy honey for, uh, for uh, um, wound treatment, too, right. because it's such a strong antimicrobial. Yeah. So yeah. using honey on a cut or a burn is a great thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Carl had mentioned kind of like the pollen in the uh, honey, that which brings us kind of to our, our next product. Um, the three of us don't really have any experience much with collecting pollen, uh, but pollen is another um, kind of product that you can collect from your beehives and sell to a market. And that uh, pollen is something that actually goes for a pretty high price. People really are interested in, um, you know, putting that pollen on their yogurt in the morning, just, you know, eating it as a food supplement uh, because of some of the believed benefits of helping with allergies every year. Um, but like Al had said, it's, it's something that we haven't necessarily proved. I know that some of the reasons why pollen is so important in honey is because it allows us to kind of trace where the honey is coming from. It allows us to prove that the honey is real. Um, since, you know, pollen helps us, you know, define what honey is, you know, for example. So, um, Carl, I know you said that you have seen uh, pollen being extracted. Do you want to explain that process a little bit? Yeah, so... <clears throat> Honeybees, when they go out to the flower and collect nectar and pollen, the pollen is collected on their hind legs in a little ball on a, a, on a little, kind of like a basket on their hind legs. Mm -hmm. And you get these little balls of pollen. They come back to the hive, they go in the entrance and go up and, you know, some other bees take that pollen away from them and store it away. As a beekeeper, what we can do is put an attachment on the front of the hive. Mm -hmm that as those bees go through, that pollen kind of gets brushed off, it gets right. knocked off into a little tray on the bottom. Mm -hmm. And that's how we can pull that out and take that honey and, or that pollen and sell it and do whatever with it. Now, you have to be very careful because the bees need that pollen mm -hmm. to keep that hive healthy. Right. So you can't take it very, take very much of it. You can't do it for very long, mm -hmm. but yeah, that's, that's an option. It's their protein. It's right. pro pure protein. Yep. Right. Um, pollen is really important for that protein source for honeybees, and it allows them to continue to, you know, reproduce. Without that protein, they aren't, uh, you know, they're right. put in a deficit. So it kind of, you know, prompts us to ask the question with, um, you know, looking at honey that doesn't have any pollen present in it. There are those bees, you know, unhealthy? Is it just filtered out? Things like that. So that's another reason why kind of uh, pollen is important. Do any of you guys know like kind of what the price point of pollen is. <laughs> I don't know either. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's up there. Yeah. But it's up there a lot. But you don't collect much. Right. And it's a commodity, you know, it's a hard to get much. It's right. beautiful. It's really pretty when it's pretty All the different color. Yeah. Absolutely. And it honestly it tastes pretty good. I feel like you think about pollen and you're like, oh that I feel like that wouldn't taste too good. But from my experience it is a, a nice tasting product, I feel like um, but since it is pretty niche, if you are able to collect pollen and use it, um, I think that would definitely help distinguish yourself um, as a beekeeper in your area and kind of have like a niche market um, for it. So the next kind of niche product is um, propolis. So I know none of us, again, have really any um, experience in collecting it, but um, you've said that you you kind of have seen it before maybe, or you know you have some yourself. Do you want to talk I, about it? Well. Propolis or propolis, whichever, it's like banana, banana, you know, <laughs> uh, depending on who you are. I always taught propolis. There, most everybody says propolis, propolis, which one? Propolis. propolis. Yes, yeah, propolis. propolis. <laughs> but that's their glue. And it's made of gum, sap, and, and other things that the bees gather. So they, they get all this sticky stuff from trees. The majority of it, I believe, comes from cottonwood trees. But that is what they glue their frames together with. It's what was used as glue by people for many, many years. Stradivarius violins were glued together with propolis. Mm -hmm. It also has got strong, very strong microbial, antimicrobial properties. So it's good for uh, wound care. People eat it for their, for their gut health. And um, uh, it is super sticky and it's really bitter. So if you just eat it, you you could be surprised. Mostly it's sold in gel caps, I believe, for people that want to eat it. Um, for us, it's almost a bane because it's stuck all over everything. This time of year, it's really gummy. Mm -hmm. And but uh, I've got a big ball of it that we've sort of just been experimenting with, mm -hmm. scraping it off and adding it to the ball. I have no idea. I think Carl was talking about 
how to uh, cut it with alcohol. Yeah, you can and cut it with alcohol and use it as like a you know, like old cure crumb to be and put it on mm -hmm. foods and things like that. Mm -hmm. I've seen beekeepers actually collect propolis or propolis uh, you know, to, to be able to sell it. Mm -hmm. And what it is is you get it's it's a kind of a screen that they sell that you put it on the edge of the hive or up on the top inside the hive, and the bees don't like that. It's holes that they need to fill up, mm -hmm. and they'll fill it up with the propolis. And after a week or two, you take it out, you throw it in a freezer, and when you bring it out, you can kind of twist it. And it's, it gets very brittle when it gets frozen. Mm -hmm. And you can take it out of there and bundle it up and sell it. So that's, I've seen beekeepers do that, but. I wonder how they are. I've never. Know, I've always just. I, we're it. scraping it off, you and I. And yeah. I've collected a little bit of it, but nowhere near enough to sell. Have you tasted it? I've never tasted it. Taste it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll put that on my bucket list. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm the same as, as Carl, you know, and Al. I just kind of scrape it off and I'm like, oh, bye, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it can it can be a little, like, annoying trying to get frames out or trying to even just, like, open the lid. You're, you know, you're get, just, get like, Get it all over your hand. hand. Get it yeah. everywhere. That's another one of those. The thing I love about this hobby is every time you open the lid of a beehive, you come away with more questions than answers. Absolutely. You, you, I've been doing this for 50 some years and I'm still absolutely enthralled and baffled. And some of my hives, some of everybody's hives, love to use properly mm -hmm. and some don't. Mm -hmm. You know, there's some of these things that are just totally gummed up and good mm -hmm. and other ones are pretty clean. Right. They say you can tell the health of a hive by how much propolis is in there. The more, the healthier the hive. Mm -hmm. I heard. Well, I got, I I got healthy I hives because mine's all stuck out there. I won't, I won't disagree with that, but I, it yeah. certainly is a difference. Yep. Between, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, same thing with building um, like extra wats everywhere. Yeah, you know, for, some, for car yeah. yeah. Um, all right, so let's move on to kind of like other services that beekeepers can provide. So we've kind of like run through some of the main products that you can collect from a honeybee hive. Uh, but there are also other things that you can market yourself as as a beekeeper. Um, for example, you know, marketing yourself as someone that can go and collect a swarm. Um, so, do you do you all have experience doing that? Kind of, do you want to talk about that experience at all? Yeah, I, I have collected <laughs> quite a few swarms over the years, and you know, it's something that uh, you get on a list of the local beekeeping association, and mm -hmm. if there's somebody that has this thing in their yard, they don't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. They'll call you up, and you can go and you get the queen and, the, and all the bees into a box. Right. You can take it back to your your apiary, and that's free meat, right? That's yeah, that's, that's a win. So, and uh, I look at it almost as much as a marketing opportunity or a public relations opportunity than a, than a acquiring more bees because mm -hmm. people are pretty freaked out when they've got a swarm in their backyard yeah. and a big old bundle of bees has flown in. It's now hanging there. And they're scared of them. And they're really, at that point, they're full of honey. They're not defensive. They don't have a hive to def defend. They're pretty docile. And it's a good opportunity to talk to the, the owners and the neighbors, whoever shows up, mm -hmm. about bees and beekeeping and, and what a swarm is. And uh, um, I used to charge to go get them. I don't anymore. And I probably, I don't know, I probably get five to ten a year mm -hmm. and get calls for double that. Wow. And I also, I think most of the beekeepers have gotten, so the first thing you ask is how high up is it? Yeah. And the second thing is you ask if you, have you thrown rocks at it, sprayed them with the hose <laughs> or sprayed bug killer on it? Yeah. And the third thing is how big is it? Mm -hmm. If it's the size of a softball or a soccer ball or a basketball, if it's a basketball, we're going to race to get there. Yeah. Because that's a lot of bees. And uh, there, I've seen swarms that would almost fill, fill a bushel basket. Mm -hmm. And and most of them are soccer ball size. Yeah. And and they're pretty easy to catch. They're kind of fun. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I know um, I had some experience catching swarms with my, my dad, you know, when I was really young. And then um, I remember it was probably like, 
you know, a month or two after I'd gotten my driver's license and I had someone call and my dad was like, all right, you're going to go, you know, solo this time. And I was like, oh my goodness, like, I don't know if I can handle that. But I had, uh, you know, drove down to wherever I needed to pick it up and um, just collected the swarm that was actually like at the base of a tree. So it was like just me scooping bees into, into a box. Um, but definitely, uh, similar to Al, I would probably catch like maybe five or more um, swarms a season. And so that was always like a great opportunity. Similar to Carl, I would picture it as free bees. Um, I never really charge for those services. I know a lot of beekeepers do charge for those services um, because, you know, people need swarms to get taken care of um, or the bees are going to die, uh, maybe, you know, if the people want to kill them. So it's a good opportunity to, for you to show up, educate people about um, honeybees, educate people about pollinators um, in general. Um, and then you have a potential customer in the future, they say, oh, this beekeeper, you know, collected these bees for me, I want some of that honey. Um, so it's definitely a good community relations opportunity and a good opportunity to, um, you know, restock after the winter. A lot of times, um, as kind of like hobby beekeepers, we um, lose quite a few bee hives over the winter. And so I, and they always swarm in the spring, so it's a good opportunity to, to go and, you know, replenish your, your stock of bees. Um, there's also the opportunity with beekeeping to connect with other farmers and to, you know, market yourself as, you know, for your pollinator services. Um, do you all have any experience with that or kind of have any comments? I don't, but that's, I know one of the, I, I don't do it, but I know that's one of the ways that beekeepers make a lot of money. I mean, that's one of the primary ways commercial beekeepers make a living at doing this is by mm -hmm. selling the pollinator services. They'll load those beehives up in trailer trucks or wagons or whatever they can and move them into orchards or, you know, the big ones down in California with the almond orchard where a lot of beehives are shipped mm -hmm. down to Southern California and into California to do the almond orchard. So that's a good way to make money if you want to you know, go solo and try to make a living at doing beekeeping. Yeah. That's definitely one of the things you're gonna to have to do. And, and the, the beekeepers that do the almond pollination, the citrus crops and the big crops that way, um, they have many, many hives and they, they, they treat them on a more industrial scale than any of us. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have an acquaintance that, that has eight employees and works 8,000 hives of bees. I'm absolutely in awe. I don't know how they how That's they can do it. Yeah. I don't I don't see how they can do it. But they certainly can't spend very much time on the health of each colony the way we do. You know, we're right. inspecting them a lot. We we treat them for mites. We, we kind of micromanage our eyes so they're so they're pretty happy and pretty efficient. And the commercial beekeepers don't do that. But we really need them. The industry needs that mm -hmm. as well as the the food supply. Right. I've got four hives in a nearby orchard, and what I get out of that are apples. Yeah. Uh, he gives me apples and more <laughs> apples and more apples, and if I didn't have my bees there, I'd have a very angry neighbor. Right. And he's very happy to have them. Uh, he's scared of the bees. He doesn't like the hives. Mm -hmm. and so it's a good. It's a. It's a mutual arrangement but um, I don't charge for pollination I never and I don't really know anybody around here who does that mm -hmm. I did just hear a statistic that if there are honeybees in the soybeans when they're blooming mm -hmm. they'll have up to 14 percent higher yield mm -hmm. so the farmers don't need the honeybees at this point because all the, the soybeans are self pollinated right they're, they're um, genetically engineered so they don't need insects for pollination, mm -hmm. but the honeybees really increase their yields. Right. So the farmers really should cooperate with this better than they do to help keep our bees in good shape so they can increase their own yields. Yeah, I wish absolutely. they would. Yeah. Um, that's interesting that you mentioned that. About four years ago, that was one of my like research ideas that I was thinking about doing for um, the year. And it was like looking at how honeybees can increase soybean um, production, just because they are self-pollinated, but looking at if honeybees increase that production. So it's interesting that now that research has come out and has shown that they do increase um, the That's production. A, a young lady at Penn State, or at uh, OSU that did it. Yeah. Elizabeth Stern. 
Okay. The time, she's the one that actually was looking at that. Yeah. Soybeans and will beans pollinate soybeans? Yeah. And the answer is yes. And then you find out that, yeah, it raises the yield quite a bit. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And an interesting question that I have sometimes pondered about is that you can, you know, correct me if I'm wrong or talk to me a little bit more about it. But um, I've sometimes heard that honeybees are less likely to go out and pollinate if they only have one crop to choose from. So, like, they may, if you feed them sugar water, they may just choose to stay in their hive, eat that sugar water, then go out and collect the same thing every day. What, it, what do you, you know, do you have, have you heard about that? You know? I, I do, I'm not aware of that. I'm not okay. aware of that, no. Uh, I, I know if you feed them sugar water, they're going to eventually stop taking the sugar water. Right. They're going to go out of the hive and get nectar and pollen on their own. Yeah. Get stuck with extra sugar water. When when that worker bee leaves the hive, she goes to the same kind of flower on that trip right. every time. So that when a bee comes in and does the bee dance that says, we have a strong crop over here, mm -hmm. and a whole bunch of bees go there. Right. There's also some other bees that are out going to a different crop and saying, hey, I got something good over here too. Yeah. So they don't always have their eggs in one basket. Mm -hmm. When there is a major honey flow of some particular thing that's very productive, mm -hmm. the majority of those bees are gonna be going there. Mm -hmm. And they're going to go to the crop that's closest. They're opportunistic, just like the rest of us. Right. And they're going to go to the nectar source that's the strongest. Sure. So, you know, that's kind of, talk about marketing a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, this year, I decided to put some eyes in the middle of a black locust grove. Right. Because the black locust honey is really, it's really good. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it's a specialty yeah. thing that by putting those hives there and being careful about when I put an empty super on and when I took it off, I could market that as an artisanal honey. Mm -hmm. Say this is black locust. Well, I shot myself in the foot. The black locust trees froze this year, and there was no bloom. Uh -huh. Last year there was a great crop, but mm -hmm. this year there wasn't any. But that's that's the kind of thing where something like that happens, and it's a big flower event. Yeah, yeah. they'll go pretty much to that. One. Yeah. But I don't I don't know about otherwise. What yeah. They were. I'm not sure exactly like where I heard that or you know when. So I was just something I wanted to ask you know like personally. Um, so you had mentioned kind of like um, that artisanal honey with the black locust. Do you have any kind of recommendations for anyone that may be trying to, um, you know, have like a specific crop honey, like, you know, market it as clover honey or something else? Like, how do you know that it's going to just be that? Like, do you have any like tips on setting it up, things like that? Well, I think it's just like what Al said. I mean, <laughs> put your hives in a place where yeah. that's where the bees are going to go because it's such a good nectar sores, right. pollen sores. So the orange blossom honey that you can buy in the supermarket, those beekeepers, they, when the orange trees are starting to blossom, they'll put their hives there. Mm -hmm. And chances are the bees are gonna take those, you know, that nectar, that pollen, and you know, use it, right? Right. Whether it's true or not is debatable. Yeah. You know, I think it's really difficult. Theoretically, yeah. It's really difficult. I yeah. think that we all think we know what flavors our honey has, and we call it one thing or another, we're probably mostly wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that the only way you really know is to give it to somebody who can look at the pollen in the honey with a yeah. microscope and tell you what it is. Mm -hmm. And that's really fun to find that out. Yeah. But I think it varies when you take the honey off, mm -hmm. um, you know, what particular point of the year, and how carefully you control the super. You put that super on empty, but withdrawn comb, right when those trees or that clover blooms, mm -hmm. and pull it off when that ends. Mm -hmm. And then I think you've got a pretty good shot. Yeah. yeah. These will go three and a half miles to go yeah. get, a, you know, go get their food source. So That's right. No guarantee. <laughs> um, so kind of on the like the topic of like specifically like like, you know, different flavors of honey. I have seen some honey marketed with like flavor infused, you know, like, mm -hmm. you know, like blueberry honey, like things like that. Um, do any of you have any experience like flavoring your honey or like, or, you know? I do, I put, uh, I, I have some of my honey, my spring honey granulates really finely. So it's almost like a cream honey to start with. Mm -hmm. And then I grind up really fine hot peppers and put mm -hmm. those in with it. So it's a hot pepper infused honey. That sounds awesome. That's, it is <laughs> awesome. It's yeah. really good. 
Um, it's labor intensive and you have to learn how to grind up hot peppers so you don't die. Um, I, I learned the hard way. You open that blender up outside after it sits a while. Yeah. But, but yeah, to put those in, and um, that's really popular. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the only one I've done. Yeah. But it seemed like there was a demand for it. And, and I've we heard have people, people asking. I've heard people grinding up lavender and yeah, different things. And thing. you put it in with the honey. Mm -hmm. You mix it. You let it sit there a while. Then you filter it out. And I think that's how they do the infused honey that they sell at the oh. farm and markets. Yeah, for I've sure. I've never done it. It's almost kind of like like making almond milk. You know, you, like, you run like the almonds through and just like extract it and everything. Um, My wife did, does some honey butter every year. Oh really? Where she mixes butter and honey, and whips it up, puts cinnamon in some, some of it. It's just butter and honey, mm -hmm. and that's a real nice treat for Christmas. Yeah. Um, I don't remember. There was one year we had done something like wrong with our honey. I don't know how we do that. I think it had like crystallized, and we were trying to like to decrystallize it really quickly. So we had put it on like the stove. You know, we probably shouldn't have done that. <laughs> uh, but we ended up like burning the honey, so mm -hmm. we made. Um, like honey barbecue sauce out of it mm -hmm. and it, like actually people loved it so no, we were kind of no. like man maybe we should do this more you know <laughs> uh, but there's like all sorts of different things you can do um, with like you know honeybee products we've been talking about um, your services as a beekeeper um, are there anything that we haven't talked about yet that you guys feel like we should talk about like products wise um, do you make mead? We got a question from Kent. Um, have you all had any experience making mead? I have not. Made you have mead. not we tried it. But never made it. Well, we've made mead. Um, I like IPA, so I don't make mead very much. It's, uh -huh. Honey is expensive. We have people buy our honey a lot to make mead with. Hmm. I try to sell them the honey that came off the capping because okay. I think it's it's not as uh, high grade, mm -hmm. but they. Seem to think it's just great for me. Yeah, it's pretty easy to do. Yeah, do you know? Do you want to explain the process a little bit? Well, um, mm, well, a very long time. You 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 <laughs> need to water the honey down enough so it'll ferment. Yeah. So you're just at, like I talked about in the first place, where you want the honey to be around seventeen percent. Now you need to put enough water in it so the yeast will move in, mm -hmm. and then the the real affectionados by particular yeast to use with their mead. So they inoculate it with the yeast and then ferment it. So it's just, mead is, is honey beer. Yeah. And you ferment it and bottle it up and, uh, and and there's all kinds of different flavors that you can do with the mead as well. The, the folks that built the pyramids, that's how they were paid, by mead. <laughs> that's how they did it. Yeah. Well, Honey, yeah. honey and people have been uh, been together for a long, very long time. Uh, very long time. Yeah, absolutely. I, I myself don't have any experience making mead. My brother has experimented trying to do it. It's kind of funny. He's my younger brother, actually. He's younger than me by two years, and I re only recently turned 21. So he would uh, like brew kombucha and stuff like that. And he was like, I have to try making mead, you know, like. Uh, so we bought like all the equipment, and I think the first time he did it, it didn't work out. Um, but and then he didn't try again. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, coming back to like my original question. Now that we've kind of gone through a lot of different like services and products, are there anything that like we may have missed that you want to talk about? We never really finished the discussion on extracting. I know we. I yeah. We kind of mm -hmm. we hopped on the on right. the wax, um, and then just kind of jumped down the the list. So we can go Did back. You have a picture of this. After you take the cappings off and you put those frames in the extractor, then the extractor is a big centrifuge. There's several different designs of them. Um, a beginning beekeeper, you can usually rent an extractor uh, or be part of a bee club where they own one and use one. And most of those are two frame up. And um, they go anywhere from a a two frame extractor to a multiple radial extractor where the frames sit in radially and then they spin and the honey spins out. Mm -hmm. So that's the process for getting the honey out of the comb. Uh, if you have a top bar hive, you have to cut out the comb and crush it or mm -hmm. something else. If you have a top bar hive, you should probably have that as a demonstration only and figure you'll have a regular hive to harvest honey from because it's a it's way too much work. Mm -hmm. 
Or you can even sell the the honeycomb. I know some people yeah. are in the are always looking for that. I used to to never collect the comb, but I would I had enough people begin asking me for it that I would you know make a little bit of it for people that were that were interested in it yeah. um, that you could use like for a top yeah. top bar hive. Um, so we'll go on to like the next step here, which is then straining it. So um, either of you want to talk more about like kind of straining it. Yeah, I, what I do is I filter <laughs> mine right out of the extractor and you know, through a coarse filter first into a five gallon bucket. Okay. And then I take that and pour it through a finer mesh filter mm -hmm. into the final bucket that has an actual valve on it that I can then bottle from that mm -hmm. container. That's all I ever do. Yeah. Uh, what about you, Al? So we we uh, last weekend we extracted 220 pounds of honey. So there's a lot of honey. So we do just like in this picture where we do a double filter coming out of the extractor mm -hmm. that picks out the pieces of wax and whatnot. And then we pour that into a big settling tank and let it sit for at least a day. And then all the, the wax and anything that we missed going through that floats to the top. Mm -hmm. And then you can bottle out of that and it's very clear and marketable right that way. As soon as we hit that, that frothy part at the top, mm -hmm. we we bottle that in larger jars and then we sell it as cooking or, okay. or to the meat market. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. What we do at Stratford is, you know, like just like this picture is mm -hmm. the double filtering with a kind of a, a wider one and then a more finer mesh. Um, back at home, sometimes we would just do, you know, like the wide, wide mesh. Um, so I think when we first got started, we would use cheesecloth, but that gets really messy, messy. pretty quickly. It clogs um, up. Yeah. Right. It, it clogs up pretty bad. So definitely having kind of like that stainless steel mesh uh, filter is really helpful. Like if you're just getting into, um, you know, making and selling your honey, definitely it's something that you want to invest in. And there's all sorts of different types of, you know, sizes of extractors, like Al said. Um, that vary in price. Sometimes you can buy even a used one if you um, go and check it out first. So you know you make sure it's not broken or anything. Um, so, but I know one of the things I, I really try not to do is heat the honey at all. Yeah. I don't think you want to heat the honey. Uh, you know the wax will get dissolved in it if you heat it too hot. Plus you're breaking down a lot of the protein, a lot of the flavors that's in the honey. Right. And it really degrades the honey the, the warmer you make it. So right. I. I try to completely stay away from honey. I know a lot of beekeepers that have a lot to filter mm -hmm. and heat it up a little bit. It goes a lot faster through that filter. Yeah, it does. But I try. I, I myself try not to do that because I just think it degrades the honey. Mm -hmm. The we will will heat it in the jars if it granulates and it's a really coarse granulation. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then we try to keep that. Uh, under the kind of temperature that it might see in a hive, so not to get it much over 100 degrees. Um, honestly, yeah. I do a lot of the uh, melding down of that, that granulated honey on my dashboard. Really? Um, yeah, I put so it on the dashboard of the car yeah. and it, it, it clarifies pretty quickly. Wow. The, one point about this filtering is that you're not filtering out the pollen. And so, um, this this will still have all those health benefits of having pollen mixed in with it, yeah. and so that's a really good. Um, if you, the, there are these micro filters mm -hmm. that some of the honey coming into the country from other places like China are micro filtered, and you cannot tell where that honey came from, or nor what kind of honey it is because there's no pollen left. Right, and those are those are if the honey is heated and it's pushed under pressure through a micro filter. Mm -hmm. A strainer like this doesn't take the pollen out. Right. The this micro the micro filter, like Al was saying, it um, the size of the filter is smaller than the size of pollen. And if you think about the size of pollen, pollen is pretty small, but um, you know, micro filtering it definitely like gets rid of any of the positive um, you know benefits that honey provides. If that's what you're looking for, if you're looking for something that's just sweet, then you know, honey that has been micro filtered it will you know do the trick but definitely if you're more interested in kind of like the health benefits or even just knowing that it's quality honey um definitely look for more of like the local or like non micro filtered honey for sure um so we have one more picture um and this the is caffeine. yeah filtering out the caffeines and do you, do either of you want to talk a little bit more about that i know you had said that you um will sometimes use like the caffeines honey for um 
for me. Uh, do, do anybody else want to like add to that at all? Or? There's nothing wrong with it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I let it sit overnight, and it actually goes into the bucket. But with my good honey, I never even thought of separating it out to yeah. sell it as some less quality. But the, the, the stuff we sell is a lower quality has gone through that wax melting. So oh, it has yeah, been okay. That's different. Oh. And, and it'll yeah. be darker. Yep. And, it, yeah. um, and, and so it does get pretty warm in that solar yeah. wax melter. Mm -hmm. And typically, we're looking that, that 200 pounds of honey, we ended up, I think, with four pounds of honey out of the wax melter. Yeah. The rest of it was all just drained out and uh, bottled up. Mm -hmm. All right, so that was kind of our like rundown of the extraction process. This is mainly looking at like those cappings like we mentioned and then also the honey. Um, but throughout the, the video, we've talked about a, a lot of different things um, product-wise that we can um, extract. We have another question from Kent, and he wants to know, what is a solar wax melter? So I know you had talked about it a little bit at the beginning. Would you want to kind of run through what that was again? Um, I, I, I wish I had a picture of it because that would be better. But <laughs> yeah. um, the wax melter that I have is a homemade job. It's a wooden box that's painted black with a piece of glass on top and the box is, is mounted on a slant and then the, the bottom of it is at an angle to that. So there's a, a pan, a tray in the bottom which uh, I think my father folded up or, or bought. But if I were to make it over again, I would use a stainless steel drywall pan because they're tapered sides. It's a really nice size. And then to build the box to fit that pan. And then you need some kind of a metal pan that you're going to dump the cappings into. And then there's a couple of notches cut in the bottom of that pan with a screen underneath it. So as the the goo that you put in there melts, it runs down and backs up and is filtered through that window screen and drips into the drywall pan. Mm -hmm. So that the, and then all it has is a piece of window glass on top. Yeah. Um, I think the original one actually had a frame and a piece of glass and that came apart. So now I just have a, an old storm window that I drop on there. Mm -hmm. And it gets hot enough if you orient that towards the south in a day's time, it'll melt all of those cappings completely and drain them down. And what's left on the pan is, or the, the upper tray is what we refer to as slum gum. And that's mostly propolis and um, dirt. It's from, you know, the older your comb is and the more travel stained it is, mm -hmm. the more you've just got dirty feet from all those bees walking around it. So really fresh cappings give you beautiful light colored cappings and if you decide you're going to melt down an old comb in there you'll be sorry mm -hmm. because it's mostly just going to be uh, gunk that's stuck on that so that that slum gum then i when it's still warm i scrape it off with a putty knife wipe it on a piece of newspaper i use it for fire starter in my wood stove in the winter um, I'm sure there's a market for it, but I don't know what it is. So that it's really good. Product. It's yeah. really gummy. It's mostly propolis. All right. Yeah, that's... Um, does that answer your question? It kind of does. That's yeah. definitely like, like it would be great to have a picture. I know, yeah. I know I've know, i seen a picture of it, but I'm sure mm -hmm. that people like watching are probably going to be like, oh man, what? <laughs> well, we could always upload one. That's true. Side. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, so we have about seven minutes left. If you're watching and you have any questions, um, you know, definitely throw them in the live chat right now. I'm going to ask Alan, Carl, if they have any kind of like last recommendations for beginner beekeepers, whether that be, you know, like just like motivation or just like anything that they wish they knew when they had gotten started um, to kind of wrap things up. So, so Carl, would you want to go first? From or? my perspective. <laughs> okay. From my perspective. Yeah. Uh, beekeeping is a bit of work. I yeah. mean, you really got to take care of your hives. Mm -hmm. If you want to be a hobby beekeeper and have a hive in your backyard, that's great, but you have to take care of the hive. Mm -hmm. You have to do the proper maintenance on the hive. Mm -hmm. Treat for varroa mites. Feed them when they need it to be fed. You really need to keep on top of it. Because if you don't, the problem is your my hive is going to go over and rob your hive when it's about dead. Mm -hmm. And going to bring back all kinds of diseases, varroa mites. I mean, right now, 
in the world of beekeeping, there's a lot of different diseases, a lot of different things going on with these hives. Mm -hmm. It's not so easy as it was back when I was 15. Mm -hmm. That's right. When I took my class, we had one disease we talked about. It was easy to treat, and that was it. You pretty much set up your hive and let it go and collected honey off of it. Mm -hmm. Now it's a whole different world, and there's a lot going on with honeybees, and you really need to have them. You really need to maintain them. Mm -hmm or you're doing a disservice to the whole industry and everybody around you that might have honeybees. Yeah. So that's, that's my two cents worth. Absolutely, no, that's, um, I was not mm -hmm. like expecting a, an answer like that at all, but that's definitely like a, an important perspective and definitely an important recommendation for a beginner beekeeper. Um, Al, what about you? Well, I'd piggyback off of that <laughs> and say so that if you're going to get into the hobby, um, take a class, get a good mentor, it's somebody who's willing to answer your questions when you have them, and you will have them. Like I said, I've still got them. Mm -hmm. so, so find somebody with some experience who's willing to come and help you out for a year or two. Um, it's pretty common that you lose the bees mm -hmm. over the winter. I mean, I think that even good beekeepers are losing 40% or better per year. Mm -hmm. So um, it's expensive to get started in probably 250 to $500 investment, mm -hmm. and chances are that they're gonna die on it. So having somebody really, a good strong mentor is critically important. Um, I also, not everybody agrees with me, but I think that beekeepers, even experienced beekeepers should wear a veil. Um, that if you get stung in the face, it really hurts. If you get stung in the eye, you can lose the vision. So I, I think you should wear a veil. I don't care. I don't wear gloves most of the time. Most experienced beekeepers don't. You've got better dexterity. Um, you probably get stung less barehanded than you do with gloves because you're not so klutzy. I'm a klutz. I'm clumsy. I get in a hurry. I do stupid things. Mm -hmm. I've knocked over hives. I've <sighs> dropped supers. I've dropped frames. If you're working in shorts and you drop a super on the ground, you're probably going to get stuck. Mm -hmm. So, so work slowly and deliberately, and be careful. Don't get in a hurry. Mm -hmm. um, don't work your bees on a rainy day if you can avoid it. Uh, but it's really fun and it's fascinating. And most of the time, the bees are super gentle. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I I was in bees this morning. Uh, I think went through six or seven hives of bees before lunch, and uh, I got stung once, and that was because I've got one hive that's really aggressive, and I squished it by accident. So it was my fault, it wasn't her fault. Mm -hmm. So, but it's it's not, you shouldn't, if you're a carpenter, you're gonna get a splinter. If you're a beekeeper, you're gonna get stung. Mm -hmm. So face that, but don't let that stop you. Absolutely. Sunny bees are fascinating. Yeah, they're really amazing, yeah. amazing animals. Yeah. Really yeah. yeah, I think I, I will definitely kind of um, add to what both Carl and Al have said. I know when I was first getting started, I was really lucky to have um, like a few mentors. And um, like I had said, my dad was helping me get into it. Someone who had, you know, some beekeeping experience, not a ton. But his biggest tip for me was to just move slow and to, um, you know, be confident and to respect the hive you know so mm -hmm. i think those are all definitely really important things one of my biggest tips would probably be to you know get connected with your local local beekeeping association yep. um, i was always going to the Sayota valley beekeepers association meetings um, even it's just like a young little middle schooler and high schooler i was always going just so i could you know connect with other beekeepers in my area see what their struggles are um, see what their solutions are to those problems um, and then just to continue educating myself. Like Al said at the beginning of this video, you're always learning as a beekeeper. And I think that, um, you know, you gain that perspective of you can always learn, um, which is an important life skill, you know, outside of beekeeping. So um, that's kind of like my tip there. We have one last question and then we'll end it there. Um, Kent again wants to know, how do we get young people into beekeeping? Uh, does anybody have any, you know, revolutionary answers to this question? <laughs> Well, I think you, you take them along with you. It's like when uh, he's, he watched an observation hive, I looked over the shoulder of somebody who was pulling frames out and showing me things, and it's just to, to get that interest going. I've just purchased a, a kid-sized bee seat so Aww. that I can take kids out and, not, and have them not 
be so worried about getting in close. Yeah. And I think you have to get hands-on approach. I also have a, a dear friend who has often made the statement, we don't need more beekeepers, we need better beekeepers. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that, that getting young people involved and excited about it is great, but we, the experienced beekeepers, need to take the time to be good mentors and help people learn and, and uh, uh, be willing to do that because it, we do need more good beekeepers. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. I, um, you know, agree with that statement. Uh, Carl, do you want, before I like finish up, do you have anything else you wanted to add to that? Or no, the, usually whenever I do my extraction, you know, probably the end of the year, September, I'll invite anybody and everybody I can think of. All my customers, I always tell them if you want to come and right. see where the honey's coming from, bring your kids and, you know, it's, well, they always come and they help me extract and they crank the, you know, the, the thing and all that. So that's, they usually really get interested in it. We just had one, a young man from uh, that came, he was 11 years old. He got really interested in it. Mm -hmm. Now he's working with me. He wants a budget. He wants to know what he needs. He's going to set up a, mm -hmm. a beehive on his uncle's farm. And we've had him out at Trapper a couple of times putting together equipment because that's yeah. how we all got started. Mm -hmm. so right. he's, he's been building frames and things like that. So it's kind of fun to watch him evolve and but I think it's just anything you're doing with the bees, you always invite kids to come along and watch and, right. you know, they yeah. do it from a safe distance. I make sure they're not going to get stung and turned away from it. But yeah, absolutely. I do. Education and exposure, I think, are the two main things. You know, there yeah. are a lot of different paths you can take in that. Um, like I said, I had some important teachers in my life, you know, guide me towards beekeeping that I probably wouldn't have pursued otherwise. Um, and, you know, whether that's in school, you know, at Stratford, you know, um, with your, you know, parents, if parents want to help, you know, their kids get into beekeeping, if that's something that they want to pursue themselves. But, um, you know, like Al said, we need to better ourselves so that we can better the future, um, which is one of, you know, my main reasons for wanting to go into education in particular is so that we can, you know, better our future. So um, thank you, everyone. We just went over about one minute in our time, so I just want to wrap up now. Thank you, um, Al and Carl, for your um, experience and your time and your dedication to beekeeping. Um, if you, pollinator week. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we really mention that here. It's I know, it's, pollinator. it's Pollinator Week. If you um, did not see our live stream on Tuesday, Carl was with me talking about native pollinators, which is um, kind of why Pollinator Week was started and talking about the importance of pollinators. Um, and again, I want to remind you all that every Thursday we have our Beginner Farmer Growing Collaborative Series here on YouTube. We'll go live at 4 o'clock and all the videos are always available afterwards. Um, and again, uh, like the video, subscribe to our channel, and um, you know, check out the links that are in our description. So thank you all for you know, tuning in and hearing from us, um, having a conversation about you know, beekeeping and some products. All right, so have a good week. Thank you.